So our next presenter for the day is Monique van Rienen. Monique is a PhD student in linguistic anthropology at UM, specializing in Indonesian Islam. She received her BA in English and Spanish from Cornell University in 2014. As a recipient of the prestigious David L. Boren Fellowship, Monique was a visiting scholar this spring at both the Andalas University in Padang, Indonesia, and at the Center for the Study of Islam and Society at Hidayatullah State Islamic University in Jakarta. Monique would like to change the assumption that Westerners often have of the, quote, oppressed Muslim woman in need of liberation, unquote, while bringing attention to the fact that Indonesia is the largest Muslim-majority nation in the world. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming Monique. Thank you. with a Kahoot game. If you're not familiar with it, if you go to kahoot.it, um, I'm sure many of you might have used this in your classroom before. I was a former high school Spanish teacher at um, Oakland Catholic High School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and this was really popular with my students. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about Islam in Southeast Asia, um, which is a lot of people, when they think about Islam, they think about, in the Muslim world, they think about the Middle East, and that's a lot of what our media portrays. Um, a lot of my experience since 2014 has been in Southeast Asia, um, working with Muslim-majority populations. So this is just a little bit of um, some knowledge just to see what you know and um, just some fun facts along the way to kick us off. So is everyone more or less logged in? Yes? No, not yet? <laughs> The most competitive I've seen Kahoot is at teacher workshops. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The champ. <laughs> All right. All set? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All set? Great, we'll get started. All right. So what is the largest Muslim-majority country in the world? This one's a bit of a freebie. <laughs> yeah, so Indonesia is the largest Muslim-majority. It is not a Muslim nation, but um, the largest population with about 87% right now. Um, so what percentage of the world's Muslim population lives in Southeast Asia? <laughs> mm -hmm. So about 40%, so almost half of the world's population, um, mostly in Indonesia, Malaysia, and in um, Brunei as well, though also parts of southern Thailand. All right, Islam is the official religion of which Southeast Asian country? Um, there are two correct answers here, so you have a 50-50 shot. You just hit one, but there's two that are possible. So Malaysia and Brunei are both officially um, Islamic states. All right. So how did Islam come to spread to Southeast Asia?
Mm -hmm. So most of this was coming through, through the, we'll talk about this a little bit, through the Silk Road and through a lot of the maritime trade routes um, in the, the early eras of, of globalization and migration. So um, we talk a lot about holy wars and a lot of this was very, um, just kind of passive merging of cultures. So in which century did Islam arrive to Southeast Asia? Um, this is up for debate, but this is kind of the most commonly accepted answer. <laughs> Not with me. <laughs> yeah, so early in the, most scholars agree that around the 13th century is when, um, when Islam arrived in, in Southeast Asia, primarily um, through Arab traders and then also through some of the routes through India as well. Um, in which Southeast Asian country is Arabic recognized as a national language? So the Philippines actually, which is a um, Christian Catholic majority nation, but they recognize Arabic as one of their national languages. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think. And which percentage of Indonesians identify as Muslim? Yeah, so about 88% um, are Muslim, and then after that, there's Christian, Protestant, and Catholic, um, Hindu, and then Buddhist, and then local religions. And last question, um, how many mosques are there in Indonesia? What? You didn't tell us this. <laughs> There's about 800,000. Um, by comparison, in the US, there's about 400,000 um, Christian churches. From, there's in America, there's about 400,000 um, churches. And I grew up in a town where there's a church on every corner. So, um, but in Indonesia, that there, it's different than in the United States, where a lot of people belong to a congregation. Um, in Indonesia, most times people go to the closest mosque to pray during the time of prayer. So it's less about membership and more so about having a space to go and pray or to rest or to um, read the Quran or to, to spend time. Yeah. Um, so with that, my presentation focuses on Islam in Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of what I do is looking at, I've looked at youth culture, which is primarily what this will be about. I taught as a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Indonesia in 2014 at a public senior high school. And then my research brought me back to look at migration in Sumatra and looking at how youth use different local languages. And my current dissertation research is about Muslim women activist groups and their political involvement, especially after Indonesia just finished its presidential election, and thinking about the ways that, again, portraying Muslim women and how they become activists in the community. I work with um, primarily very conservative populations and communities, so thinking about the, the story that we see coming from the Western media of the oppressed woman um, versus what's actually happening in Indonesia, and just the fact that Indonesia is often not recognized as kind of this big part of the Muslim world, both globally, just in general, and also sometimes I find um, when I'm working with other Islamic scholars that Indonesia is often on the margins along with the rest of Southeast Asia. So this is a way to think as well about when we're talking about the Muslim world and Muslims around the world, what we're talking about and the diversity that we're recognizing um, with our students and also just giving a comparative approach. When I taught high school at a private Catholic school, my students were very curious about other students that lived in other parts of the world and what their lives were like. So this is also an opportunity to think more comparatively and to think about other 
cultures and the way that people live their lives and recognizing that teenagers across the world are pretty much very similar. Um, Justin Bieber was a big thing when I was there. Um, but a lot of it is just recognizing that there's a lot of similarities amid the differences. Um, so my goals with this, first of all, thinking about Islam and Southeast Asia broadly. Um, with this, I'm thinking about some of the different areas of study that you teach and different ways that this might be able to be incorporated, um, looking at some of your responses for what you're interested in, so thinking about world history, comparative government, um, visual studies and art, literature, different ways that this might come in. Um, afterwards, I'll focus more on Islam and Indonesia. That's really where my experience has been and where my knowledge is. Um, and after that, talking more anecdotally about Muslim youth in Indonesia from my experiences both as a teacher and as a researcher and in the relationships that I built and maintained while I was there. And finally, we'll end with some brainstorming for you all to think about ways of incorporating this with what you learned from the presentation earlier and what you'll learn later on today and thinking about different ways of, of using this as a tool both for what you teach and for also addressing some of the misconceptions and the Islamophobia that we unfortunately face in our, our country and our communities. So in Southeast Asia, you have about 100 million, or almost 1 billion of the um, world's Muslim population is in Southeast Asia. So when you look at it like this with the circles, a lot of what we think about is it's Indonesia centered in the Middle East. Um, right now, I'm actually in town from, I'm taking an intensive Arabic course at the University of Pittsburgh with a Jordanian professor who was very surprised to learn that Southeast Asia was the Muslim majority region of the world. Um, which has sparked a lot of conversation in the class that I'm taking, but even among Muslims themselves, um, that it's not always well known, but thinking about the way that it's spread. So a lot of what is the Muslim population is in Southeast Asia. What happens though, is that a lot of the conversation is thinking about defining Islam. And in a lot of my Islamic studies courses, what we think about when we talk about Islam is something that's very fluid, that's constantly being negotiated. So a lot of times people will think, well, in Indonesia, is it really Islam? Is it an Indonesian form of Islam? Where do we draw those boundaries about what counts as Islamic practice? What is cultural practice? Who decides what those things are? Um, so you have different versions, and we'll see some of those, of Javanese practices of the call to prayer that are very popular in Java, but when you look in the Middle East, they're considered to be non-Islamic. Or you think about different practices that come from the Middle East into Indonesia by way of people going on pilgrimage, people moving back and forth for work, especially in this day and age, where things become mixed up on whether this is Arab culture, or this is part of Islamic tradition, or this is Indonesian. And a story when I was in Jakarta at the State Islamic University, one of the most well-known professors came to the mosque in Mecca to pray. And he was wearing an Indonesian batik shirt, which is usually these beautiful, intricate floral patterns. And he was told that he could not enter the mosque because he was wearing women's clothing. And he looked at the man that told him he couldn't enter, who was wearing one of the longer um, garments that are typical in Saudi Arabia. And he said, well, in my country, you're wearing a dress. <laughs> so it's these negotiations that happen about what counts where and who decides, and so he did enter the mosque, and it's his favorite story to tell about these different ways that, that Islam is recognized. So it's also, Indonesia is proud in the way that it stands apart, but also is trying to be part of, recognize as part of that broader Muslim community in the world. Um, so if you look at the map, you have the Muslim population in Southeast Asia, where Indonesia is the largest population. Um, followed by Malaysia, and then the Philippines, especially in the south. Um, if you are up on your current events last year, um, thinking about Mindanao was a big part of that, so southern Philippines especially. Um, same with southern Thailand and Myanmar. Singapore, because you have a lot of back and forth of people from Malaysia and Indonesia coming in for trade and working in Singapore, um, just because it's a lot more lucrative. Um, Brunei, as a... Um, Islamic government, um, and then Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos. 
So you have these populations that aren't always recognized. We think of the Philippines as a primarily Catholic country. Um, but and thinking about the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, but we often forget about the fact that there are these different areas. Um, so we'll take just a couple minutes for a think pair share. If there's anything that surprises you about this, and why Southeast Asia? Um, what might be the reason that Southeast Asia came to be this region that where Islam was not born in Southeast Asia, but it came to be this this large, important region in the world. Um, so we'll take a minute just to think. Um, after that, we'll take two minutes to share with someone or your table sitting around you, and then we'll open up as a group and we'll share some of our ideas. So go ahead and take some time to think and, and talk it through. So we can bring it back together. Is there anyone that wants to share either something that you found interesting or surprising by this or reasons why Southeast Asia? Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to volunteer? Mm -hmm. Anyone? I think they're still busy talking. Okay. Any thoughts on why Southeast Asia? Trade. trade. What about trade? <laughs> oh, no, I get the microphone. Oh, Lord. Yes. Uh, we were just thinking about um, the trade routes because they're, you know, the sea, it's all surrounded all islands, so it would be easy to get from one place to another if you had a boat. Our other question, mm -hmm. though, is um, with the percentages the way they are, the countries that have a lower percentage not just raw numbers, but the lower percentage, is it because they were uh, colonized by the British, the French, and the um, Spanish, but you know, but that you know, Indonesia is such a high percentage, but Singapore is only 16%. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to figure out the, the differences in the percentages. Yeah, colonialism plays a big part in it. Um, the thing with Indonesia, Indonesia is the geographically and thinking about the, the area of the land is the, I think, fourth largest country in the world for landmass. 
Um, and because it's an archipelago, so that you have to think about for colonization how difficult it is to manage 12,000 islands of people. Um, versus if you're looking in somewhere where you think about Malaysia being colonized by the British, that you don't have as much land um, to control. And with Indonesia as well, so you have especially in the east, um, you have the Spice Islands. So cinnamon especially was um, very big for, for trade in the, the 13th century. Um, so thinking about, and it, exactly like you said, with trade, the fact that when you're going by ship as opposed to land, like people move a lot faster and people can move more frequently. So thinking about the, the archipelago, um, for Indonesia especially, and proximity because you're close to um, India. It's not, and it's not a surprise that m the majority of Muslims in Indonesia live in Sumatra because it's closest to India, it's closest to Saudi. So when traders landed, they're gonna look for the first piece of land they see. Um, so that's a big part of it. Other thoughts? I was just wondering if the um, the Myanmar number would need like adjusting after recent recent events with the genocide, or if the Rohingya were a small percentage of that projected four percent. That's a good question. Um, something that I know less about. I have a colleague who works um, in. He's actually in Myanmar right now doing research with um, the Rohingya population. I think with a lot of that, because so much of it is th is talking about. Um, when you look at, you have Bhutan up here, so you have kind of this idea, are they Bhutanese, are they, um, are they Burmese, and this idea. So the numbers, I mean, and you think as well about how people, when you think about surveys, the choice to self-identify is, well, I can claim Burmese heritage on this side, so I'm going to do that to protect my family. So um, I think this was from 2015, so about when things were, when it was becoming more, more difficult. So yeah, some of these numbers, and, and it's also thinking about surveys, um, how many people are choosing to identify themselves and how data is being collected. Um, we have that thinking about our census coming up next year as well, what's being asked and how people are answering. So um, other thoughts? Sarah? <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm from Malaysia. I was trying to remember my history a little bit. <laughs> um, so besides trade, there could also be uh, marriage. So uh, the Arab traders would stay in like Malacca and they would marry uh, women. And that was how one way of like how Islam spread in Malaysia. I don't know for the other countries. And um, also, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the sultans in the nine states we have in Malaysia, um, they adopted Islam as like, something they should practice, and they also encourage their people to also convert. So I think that's how there's a lot of Muslims in Malaysia. Yeah. yeah. Religion and politics are hand in hand. And a lot of times, um, especially thinking about colonialism in Indonesia, uh, Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch. And at times, the Dutch tried to take advantage of um, this Islamic identity to bring people together to make them more governable. Um, and other times, especially with the, the Padri Wars in Sumatra, trying to, because of this fear that this coming together of Muslims is something that could overthrow the Dutch government. So this idea of trying to break apart these Muslim communities through these wars and pitting them against each other. Um, so using this as a political tool for governing, which again comes hand in hand with, with colonialism. Um, but you get all these different reasons about why these different areas become more populated than others. So um, moving on, my focus is primarily, so Sarah knows a lot about Malaysia and um, we'll hear from her later on in the, the panel at the end of the day. Um, my focus is mostly in, in Indonesia and a lot of my experiences there. Um, so looking at Indonesia, the two red areas are where I've primarily spent time. Um, and you get a great look as well uh, just about kind of how the country, it's almost, a gradient about the different religions that are represented. So in Indonesia, there are five major religions. Um, you have Islam. This map splits it between modernist and traditional, but I think that's a little misleading in the ways that people, most people in Indonesia, if I ask them, are you modernist or traditional, they'll just say, I'm Muslim. Um, so they don't identify themselves that way. 
Um, Protestantism and Catholicism are split into two separate religions. Um, and then you have Hinduism. So everyone that knows Indonesia knows Bali, um, which is the largest Hindu population. Um, and then you also have some Buddhism as well, and that's primarily with um, Chinese Indonesians. So when you look and you think about in the, the East um, was a lot of the Dutch um, evangelists were in the East, the Protestants. So that's why a lot of the Eastern Indonesia, and especially thinking about um, the Dutch coming in and coming in for the spices in Indonesia, that's why a lot of the East is more Christian. Um, the West tends to be more Muslim, but you do have um, intermarriages, you do have kind of people that mix practices and religions, um, but it's thinking mostly. So I've spent most of my time in um, West Java, which Jakarta is the capital. Um, that's where I spent a lot of my time. Previously, I was teaching in Riau province in a city called Pakambaru, which is about 92% Muslim, um, and then going back and forth to the villages in West Sumatra. And then in the green is the province of Aceh, which is the only um, province in Indonesia that is under Islamic law. Um, and a lot of people that identify as um, having Arab descendants through these, these trade networks from before. Um, so that most of Indonesia is a secular nation, but when you look at the state ideology, Pancasila has five pillars. The first one is belief in the one true God. And it's this idea of that people identify with a religion um, of one of the, the main five, which is on your ID card. Um, but this idea that, that religion is important to both national identity and to self-identity. Um, and it's very much played out there in, in the United States. We have separation of church and state. Um, religion often becomes a taboo subject. In Indonesia, it's very open and it's very visible. Um, so if you look at worldwide, we know that Indonesia has the largest Muslim population. Um, following that, we have Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Egypt, Nigeria, Iran, Turkey, Algeria, and Morocco. Um, so does this surprise anyone? I know for me, I thought that Saudi Arabia would have been on there, but does anyone have any, any thoughts about these countries? This was in 2010, so the numbers might have switched, but. Does this match people's expectations? Pretty much? A little bit? Is there something different? <laughs> oh, so you had this already. <laughs> Yeah, but thinking about this, this is, and a lot of it has to do, Indonesia has about 247 million people, so it makes sense just by population in general that they would have the largest amount by virtue of being one of the largest nations in the world. Um, so you look at this historically, and you think about the early modern trade routes. So not just silk, and so you have in red, you have the Silk Road, um, and then you have the sea routes. And all of these, especially the sea routes, are the ones that lead down into um, Indonesia, which used to be divided up into kingdoms, so Sriwijaya, um, and then the Spice Islands out in the east. But you have, so you have this great network where you look at everything coming from um, the Middle East and through the, through the subcontinent here, coming down through India, um, and then coming further down. But a lot of this is pre, um, this was all pre kind of European, the, the golden age of, of exploration. Um, but all these, so like we said before, all these networks that are coming through um, and landing in Indonesia. So the first to come through were the Spanish um, from Europe coming in through the Philippines and then down into Indonesia. And then after that, um, the Dutch East India Company coming in um, and then staying in Indonesia up through the 1940s through the Second World War. Um, and primarily for, for trade and for economic reasons. And there's still a very close tie. Um, my family is Dutch. So working in Indonesia and having a Dutch father who has learned a very different history than I have is always interesting. So Indonesia claims that they gained independence in 1945. My father will tell you 1949, and this is not something that we will ever agree on. Um, but thinking about just a lot of Indonesians during the 1960s, went to the Netherlands for education. A lot settled there. Um, my father knows fried rice. Um, he knows some of the, the shrimp crackers are called krupuk. So, and a lot of words 
are come from from Dutch, especially for our education in Indonesian. Um, a lot of words like like coffee is kopi. So a lot of you see a lot of that that history still kind of under the surface. Um, and then you have the the hadramis, which in Indonesia is a mark of status. So the hadramis were from originally were from a province in Yemen, and in Indonesia in the 70s, a lot of Muslims were going to the Middle East, especially to Yemen, for education, and then coming back to Indonesia and becoming a lot of the the popular Muslim scholars and clerics and the ones that were starting Islamic boarding schools. Um, so, and especially in, the, in Aceh, where you have a lot of people that are of Arab descent and proud to be of Arab descent. Um, so you do have these, these remnants of a past, um, of the, these networks that came through of people that identify themselves and are in positions of power because they, they identify as, as Hijrami or having these, these mixed backgrounds. Um, and that a lot of that was, was, was coming from trade as well. And so Indonesia, oftentimes, if you look in the media, is upheld um, for being this pluralistic nation of, and one of the more tolerant nations where you have these main religions that coexist peacefully. Um, the motto of Indonesia is Bineka Tunggal Ika, which is unity and diversity. So it's this idea that you have all of these diverse religions, diverse ethnicities. Um, as a linguist, there's about 7,000 languages in Indonesia. You're spanned across about 12,000 islands, and yet it's still a single nation. Um, it's been called the improbable nation. The fact that it hasn't split up into different little sub-nations. Um, so it's this idea that, that's really ingrained in Indonesian culture is this idea of unity and diversity, of understanding and respecting differences of your neighbors, and that being something that children learn in school and that people tend to preach and they use, Indonesians themselves will contrast themselves against where, and there, there are instances where there's kind of ideological differences. Um, usually those come from politics or they come from, some of it is just old family rivalries um, or ethnic conflict that gets conflated into religion. But for the most part in Indonesia, that is just this peaceful coexistence and people being very open um, and open-minded about religion. And I, one of my favorite ways to illustrate this is you have in Jakarta, um, here you have the Masjid Istiqlal, which is the national mosque. And right across the street, you have the St. Mary of the Assumption Cathedral. Um, and so you see on Sundays it overlaps, you see the Catholics going in for mass, and they come out, and then you see the Muslims going into the mosque for their, um, for their afternoon prayer. So it's just this idea that you have in this, the heart of this city, you have these two large um, places of worship that look directly across each other. Um, and I think for me, that's one of my favorite ways that this illustrates this idea of unity and diversity. Um, and religion as well being something, so we think about, um, like I said earlier, this kind of taboo of talking about religion. In Indonesia, it is something that is listed on your national ID card. Um, so this idea of both choosing one of the main religions um, to belong to that is recognized by the state. Um, just recently they passed a new ordinance that if you practice a local religion, um, so a lot of the animistic religions that are really um, kind of the pre-global, the pre-Islamic religions that are practiced in Indonesia um, now can be recognized on your ID card as well as Confucianism. So they're starting to, there are conversations about opening this idea of how people identify, but it's something that, that everyone has, that everyone will. And it's one of the, the first main questions that I get asked when I go to Indonesia is, what is your name? Are you married? What is your religion? Which, yes. Outside of religion, Islam? So, Monique, could, mm -hmm. would you repeat his question, please? Yeah, so the question is, um, in, to what extent is Islam spoken about outside of a religious context? Mm -hmm. Arabic. So Arabic is taught in schools as a foreign language a lot of times. Um, that's becoming increasingly more popular as long, uh, with Chinese as well for students that are looking to go into business. Um, I still find it in Indonesia as I'm learning Arabic right now as well. I'm very elementary. 
But a lot of it is um, people that learn to read. They go to these after-school programs to learn to read Arabic. Um, and it's mostly sight reading. It's sight reading and it's pronunciation in order to read the Quran. But to have someone who's conversant is usually someone who's involved in business. Um, so it's becoming increasingly popular as both a high school elective and as a um, college major. Yes. Your religion, excuse me, if you left your religion blank, do they use that as a form of discriminating against you for, for certain privileges? And my second question is, do the more worldly uh, Islamic people consider Malaysians Islamic? That's a great question. So the first one, um, if you leave this blank, the thing is, you can't leave it blank, um, <laughs> but people will use, so one of the older laws is that um, interfaith marriages are not recognized by the state. So what you have people do is that when your ID card expires in five years, you just put on it, you s say, I know a Christian woman who wanted to marry a Muslim man, their families agreed, um, but one of these outstanding laws from the um, pre-democratic period was that you cannot have these interfaith marriages, so what people will do is they will change their ID card to say, well, we're both Muslim. They'll get married, and then they'll switch it back um, to say that they're Christian. So, or for there are um, very small populations of people who either identify as um, atheist or agnostic, or um, Judaism in, in Indonesia is not recognized, but there are um, Jews that live in Indonesia. And a lot of times they will just choose a religion to put on their card, but then in practice. So it's just kind of for the, the government as an official tally, but what people, their private practice will be different. Um, your second question about Malaysia and Indonesia being recognized by the broader Muslim world. I think increasingly it's being recognized. Um, I still find in Islamic studies as a PhD student that it's still this idea that it's this well, they, it's kind of Muslim, but it's so mixed in with local tradition that it's not really Muslim. I think that's starting to, to dissipate. Um, that it is, you look at um, Indonesians are the biggest contingency to go to Mecca for the Hajj. Um, a lot of Indonesian students will go to, especially to Egypt, um, to Al-Azhar University for their studies. Um, a lot of Islamic scholarship is coming out of Indonesia. So I think increasingly it's being recognized as, um, as just as Muslim as the rest of the world, where before I think it was still a question. But great questions. Um, so what I look at is thinking about women, and I know I think um, Byron talked about this a little bit. So the women that I work with, I work with uh, mostly the Minangkabau population, which is spread between Sumatra and um, Malaysia as well a little bit in the mainland Malaysia. And what's interesting is that all people that identify as ethnically Minangkabau will identify as Muslim. Um, this is one of the areas that when the Arab traders came in, there was a lot of this intermarriage. Um, and that people there do very much hold on to these practices, um, identify as very pious, and it's very rare to see someone who is not. Um, but it's kind of, and so much of it is tied into, where it's one of those instances where the religion and the culture intertwine. Um, but what you have, what's interesting with the Minangkabau and all of these, these are some of the activist groups that I work with. Um, and you have the women that wear the longer veils, that wear the niqab, the face covering. Um, who are out there bringing donations to the tsunami sites, um, who have political demonstrations. And Minangkabau women, so it's a matrilineal community. So all of the property goes through the mother's line, um, which for in Islam, it's typically it goes through the, the paternal line. And I work with a lot of divorced women, interestingly enough, who have initiated their own divorces who go to the Islamic court and say, my husband is not fulfilling his husbandly duties and I want a divorce. They say, I'm Minangkabau, I have my right. Um, and, they kick, and they tell their husband, they say, the house is my property, you leave. Mm -hmm. It's M-I-N-A-N-G-K-A-B-A-U. Minangkabau. Um, it translates to the winning buffalo. <laughs> winning buffalo. 
um, from some of the, the earlier wars. But it's just this idea that, that these women who, and a lot of my, my friends that I work with wear these very long gowns, they wear the long veils, a lot of them now are starting to cover their face. Um, a lot of these women own their own businesses, they are single mothers, they travel extensively, they run, um, one woman runs tours to um, Mecca for Umrah, for the minor pilgrimage. Um, so it's just really trying to dispel this, this misconception that you look at these women and you see them with their, their faces covered or with the, the long veil that they are kind of, they're subservient to their husbands. A lot of them just got rid of their husbands because <laughs> they were done with them. Um, or that they still hold on to that there isn't this tension that, well, we are matrilineal but also Muslim, that I'm a woman who owns property and I will pass it to my daughter, um, but I'm also Muslim and that's fine. Um, and you have as well, so you have, this is a, in Padang in West Sumatra where you have mosques that, this is the, the water buffalo horn design that matches the traditional house. So in the architecture, um, Islamic, Indonesian Islamic art, there is a huge gap um, in the literature about that. So you, and then you see, especially in some of the, um, the Javanese sa shadow puppetry, you have some of the characters that become um, Kiai is a, a man with a lot of Islamic knowledge. So you have characters that were traditionally um, from the Hindu stories that become um, marked as, as religious figures in these stories. So you do have this, this mixing of, of culture where you have these beautiful mosques that have their own designs that match the, the local culture and local tradition. Um, and again, this question of culture, Indonesian culture and Islam where these things just come together, and then how, especially with this question, how this is recognized. Actually, the, the mosque in, in Padang is one of the most famous um, tourism sites for, for Indonesia because of that. Um, so you have this idea of syncretism, so this idea that it's Islam that gets mixed up, that it's this kind of melting pot, or orthodox, that it's straight by the book. And Indonesians themselves disagree on this. You know, what is Islamic, what is not? What should we do? What shouldn't we? And a lot of that depends on people's educations, kind of what schools of Islam that they subscribe to. Um, and this idea of what's religious doctrine, what is culture, and who gets to decide that. Um, and then thinking about language, so this idea that you have, and especially now that I'm studying Arabic, there is so much Arabic in Indonesian. Um, knowing Indonesian has made Arabic much easier. But you have the word wajah, um, which means face comes out of Arabic. Istirahat is um, rest or a break. Comes out of um, Arabic. Umur, um, Amr, is also, so age. Um, but you have all of these words coming in that when you look at um, these Austronesian languages, if you look at Malay and Indonesian especially, there's got to be at least 30% that's Arabic. Um, and then maybe 5 to 7% that's Dutch. Um, and then you get all of these English loan words coming in because this is the era of technology and you can um, manga print your essay, you can manga friend someone on Facebook. <laughs> um, so this idea too, if you teach foreign languages, which is something that is near and dear to my heart, this idea of languages as something that are constantly growing and changing. Um, Spanish, if any of you teach Spanish, so much of Spanish is coming from Arabic. Um, especially during the, from the 700 to about 1492 um, in southern Spain, so there's that. Um, and then thinking about the economy, that Islam in Indonesia has a huge influence on the economy. So you have um, banks that are like Bank Muamalat that are, and also other um, national banks that have the Sharia banks, which don't have the usury, um, so that are meant to be for for Muslims that they can take loans without interest. Um, you have halal tourism is a big thing right now in Indonesia, um, where it's having a lot of these visiting both holy sites, but also um, having tour groups where you make sure that the food is halal, that you take breaks during the day to go to pray, you visit all these different mosques and learn about the Islamic history in different places. Um, you have the halal stamp that is distributed by the um, Majalis Ulama is the um, Muslim scholars in, or the advisory board in Indonesia. So you have, if you want to open up a restaurant and you want the halal stamp, you need to petition and pay 
Um, and you can pay a little bit more to expedite, um, which happens. Um, Hallmarts, a lot of homeopathic medicines are coming up as being these halal medicines and alternative to Western medicine. Um, so people going to these, these halal marts for, um, as opposed to going to the, the pharmacy um, for their drugs. And then also just a lot of Muslima fashion. Um, so these outdoor markets where you have people that are shopping for the hijabs or for the dresses, a lot of it comes in a lot of imported goods from the Middle East. So dates are wildly popular. Um, anything that, a lot of honey um, and different, some of the gowns that people buy, a lot of it is is influenced. They have um, Muslim Fashion Week, they have fashion shows. So a lot of that drives it. Um, and a lot of it is driven by the Hajj as well. So in Indonesia, to with the allowance from the Saudi government, um, there's a waiting list of about 20, I think right now it's about 19 years, it's gone down a bit. So if you want to go for Hajj, you have to sign up, These people will sign up their children when they're born so that maybe you can go in the Hajin when they're 20 years old. Um, so most, uh, Indonesia sends the biggest um, Hajj contingency, and in Indonesia there's a big gift giving culture. So people will go and shop, they spend a lot of money on these packets to go for Hajj, um, and for Umrah as well, for their food, for their lodging. Um, the tourism market in Indonesia right now to go to the Middle East is astounding. Um, and then you also have these Haji Plus package. So if you want to skip the line and pay $10,000 and stay in five-star hotels and have a caterer, um, you can pay for the Plus package, um, which is also increasingly popular with people that have the means for it. Um, so this idea of religious obligation mixing with status, mixing with um, economic means in this financial market. So a lot of people are capitalizing on this right now. Um, and then you have the problem of the media. So anytime my parents worry about me in Indonesia because all they see on the news is there was an earthquake, there was a tsunami, here's a church bombing. Um, so it's this idea that what we see in the media is often case not what's going on in Indonesia. And it's these isolated cases. So last summer was the church bombing in Surabaya. Um, that was just a very isolated um, single attack and a single person. Um, and then that becomes this idea of Indonesia being less tolerant. Um, last year, there was a blasphemy case that was very high profile against a Christian governor, um, which was just led by a very small group of people, but a very loud group of people. Um, that made national news in the New York Times, BBC, um, in Aceh, thinking about some of the, the laws um, against, if you think about homosexuality or adultery, um, some of the corporal punishment that happens, that it becomes the big news story. Um, and thinking about the, the um, Bali bombings in 2004. So these are the things that we see on the news um, that often paint the picture and become the big discourse. Indonesia is less tolerant. Um, the Islamic State is coming to Indonesia. When really, when you talk to people, 99% of them want the message to be told that Indonesia is a tolerant country. Um, Indonesia is not like this. This is what the media portrays us. So thinking especially about media portrayal um, and how we engage with that. Um, so my last part here is thinking especially about Muslim youth. Um, this is mostly stories about my experience in Indonesia as a English teacher in a public high school. Um, thinking a little bit about the education system and then also thinking about ways that your students can engage with learning about Muslim teenagers in another part of the world um, and how we can use that in ways to, to fight Islamophobia. Um, so these are my English students and my co-teacher in front of the school that I taught at. Um, I taught 14 English classes, um, which was a lot. It was mostly a conversation. I coached the debate team um, the drama club and the English conversation class. So I was, I was at school all the time. I lived right behind the school too, so there was no excuse. Um, so education in Indonesia, and I'm focusing mostly on secondary, um, but you have, so you have elementary school and middle school. So elementary is first through sixth. Um, middle school is seven through nine, and then nine through, or 10 through 12 is high school. So you have the public senior high school, which is where I taught. Um, 
that is government run, that is all access for everyone. Um, you also have public vocational high school is SMK. Um, they're directed at different trades. So there's for people that want to go into engineering, there's mechanics, there's art and um, handicrafts. There's, now they have some, I think, for like flight school. Um, so those students can choose to do that. Um, you have public Islamic high schools, which is focused more on, um, on religious knowledge as well as your typical studies. Um, and then you have private schools, which usually it's a single organization that owns a elementary school, middle school, and a high school. Um, and then you have Islamic boarding schools, or pasantren, where students will live in a boarding school and they get more of an intensive Islamic education and the goal is to become a, an Islamic scholar. Um, and in all of these schools, religion is taught um, as a mandatory subject. So especially in the public senior high school and the vocational high school, um, the ones that, are, that you will have a mixed population of students, um, they will have, so the Muslim students will have their Islamic studies class once a week and the Christian students will have um, catechism and the Hindu and the Buddhist students will have their own. So even if you have two Hindu students or in your entire school, they have their own teacher and their own religion class. And then the other days of the week, you learn the other religions. So all the students will be conversant in the practices of, so you have a, a Muslim student who can tell you all about Jesus from the Catholic perspective and from the Muslim perspective. Um, you have Buddhist students who can recite um, Islamic prayers. So it's this idea that you are learning um, the world religions, both your own and everyone else's. Um, in the Islamic schools, it's mostly Muslim, it's all Muslim students. Um, so they do more intensive focus on religious study. Um, and then you have, and I can play these later on during the break, um, you have Rohis is um, Rohani Islam, which means it's Islamic spirit. And this is an extracurricular activity that students will do where they will host um, chronic reading competitions. They will do, a lot of them do a cappella groups. They'll do a fashion show. Um, but it's for students who are really interested in their faith. So you have karate club, you have Mandarin club, and you have like your Islamic club um, for after school activities that students can choose. That's becoming very popular. So students will spend their time um, they'll do cooking competitions. So it's just a way that students with similar interests can come together um, to both to learn more about their faith, but also spend time. Um, and competitions are huge in Indonesia. So having a, a forum for that is, is, is something that's popular for students. Um, and these chronic reading competitions, you have very young children that learn to read the Quran. Um, so this question about Arabic, a lot of them can read these verses beautifully, but they cannot tell you what it says unless there's a translation next to it. Um, but it's this idea that this, this oral practice that is part of an Indonesian tradition is very important as an Islamic tradition as well. Yes? I did. I was fortunate. The school that I was at um, was one that was very academically rigorous. Um, and in Indonesia, students are split. You're either on a science track um, so students that will study physics, biology, chemistry, um, or a social track. So students that focus more on economics, um, history, social studies. And that's kind of, um, if you're on a, a university track, it kind of prepares you for, for either STEM or for the, the social sciences or um, the humanities. Though there is crossover in, in both, but students who, if you're in social, you won't be taking upper level biology, which they're really happy about. Um, but English is compulsory. So you have English as compulsory, and then you have English as an elective. So some students will have it twice a week. Um, most of my students were very conversant in English, as were for the, my cohort for Fulbright. Um, most of our schools, we had a lot of English. But it's thinking about English as this global language, and students being very motivated. Plus, they watch a ton of YouTube. Um, they love American film. They love all the pop songs. So I had one student with perfect British English and she learned, it, she learned it on YouTube by herself. And you couldn't hear a trace of an accent. So English is very, there's often, especially with the younger generation, a lot of English um, and motivation to speak English, which you don't always see with American students learning Spanish, unfortunately, <laughs> as I did in my classroom. 
Um, so I was in Pakambara, which is a little red dot, um, with my co-teacher at the, the school that I taught at. So um, there were about to 1,000 students, I think, um, spread across three grades. And the school is all outdoors. Um, so the teacher moves from class to class, and you don't have hallways. You just enter the door and come out. So students will be all together with their same class all the time, so they become very close-knit. So it's not common that you meet up with your 10th grade class five years down the road. Or I know older women who are in their 70s who meet with their elementary school, school classmates. Um, so it's these very close-knit communities that are formed. Um, the teachers don't always know what's going on. There's always a lot of drama. Um, sometimes you'll call on a student to do a skit and you just call two random kids and they don't want to do it because they had a fight during math class. Um, or s crushes is a big thing. Um, dating's not really popular in Indonesia with Muslim students, um, but it's increasingly students will go together as a group with uh, male and female students to the mall um, and they have two students kind of walking a little close together and everyone else is giggling. Um, so it's not very different than, <laughs> than what we see. Um, so I have, if you have a Facebook account and want to check it out at some point, we made a Humans of New York style page called Students of Smondel, um, which was the nickname for our school. And it's pictures of the students um, and just whatever caption they felt like giving it. Either they asked, answered a question, um, so Azura is a, um, one of my Muslim students who does not veil. Um, some of her family is Christian. Her great-grandparents had converted to Islam. Um, she's mostly comfortable in a long pair of shorts and a t-shirt. She hates her school skirt. Um, she veils when she has to pray at school. She takes it off when she's done. Um, and she likes debate because of all the handsome guys she gets to meet at the competitions. Um, and Music is really big. They love singing. Um, I became a wedding singer against my will several times in Indonesia. Um, but students will come together and, and play music after school. Um, so these were two of my social students that would sit there and, and play songs. They could sing in Arabic. They could sing in English. They could sing Indonesian songs. They wrote their own music. Um, Raras was one of my debate students um, who really didn't want to be a doctor, even though her parents really wanted her to. So being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. Um, she wants to own her own business, and she's in college now. She's in one of the top universities in Indonesia in a um, pre-MBA program. She will be studying abroad in France next year. Um, and she's told her parents that she was not going to be a doctor. Um, and was one of my, she was in Rohis. Um, she won most of the chronic reading competitions in my school. So she's very, um, very, one of my very religious students, um, but very much wanted her parents to know that she was going to be independent. She didn't want her husband to, um, to just provide for her. And she wanted to have a stable income before she, she said, I'm not getting married till I'm 30. So um, there's also like a, um, like a Red Cross group for students that were interested in, in volunteering. Um, so students that do want to be doctors uh, can do that. So they would do a lot of, they would help some of the, the, local, um, the local first responders um, as part of this. So a lot of volunteerism, just like what we have here um, for activities. Um, so we'll leave it at that. If we have a couple of minutes, if you want to, just given all of that, if you have questions, we can take questions. If you want to discuss among yourselves, thinking about um, the topics that you teach, the types of students that you work with in your own school communities, um, and ways that this might be helpful both for thinking about um, curriculum, but also thinking about Muslims and Muslim teenagers around the world and how that might be a tool for having students understand a little bit more that there are more similarities than differences. Um, and recognizing those differences as something that can encourage um, conversation. So at Oakland Catholic, at the high school I worked at, we actually had during our activity period, um, and if anyone is interested, I do work with a network of schools that are interested in um, working with schools in the United States and having like either a pen pal program or they, they love practicing their English. Um, or just having these, these ways of, of, and teachers as well that are interested in connecting. Um, and Fulbright also has a program 
and I can give you the information when I look it up. Um, for teachers that are interested in learning more about uh, Islam and just Southeast Asia more generally, there's, a, I think, a three-week program to Indonesia. Um, and I know some of the alumni from it as well, where um, you do school visits. It's for educators especially. Um, it's a full scholarship. It covers all of your travel and expenses. Um, but if anyone is interested in Indonesia, claimed my heart. So, um, but yeah, any questions or discussion, feel free.